All right. Welcome to this final eight inch by 10 and a half inch uh, version of this scene. This one is going to be a follow up from this piece or this composition done kind of in a high noon type of, uh, I don't know, scenario to this one deep in the night. This one needs to get really get spray sealed and, uh, you know, to bring out the, uh, the depth in these trees right here, it really dried flat in the colors that I happen to use. But this one right here, we want to have its own, I don't know, characteristics. And um, I was thinking about the farthest that I can probably go with this one from the previous two compositions would be um, to do them in uh, a sunset type of scenario here. Merry Christmas, Don. Thanks for checking out the vid here. All right, Colorado Crafter. I haven't been to Colorado in a while. Always enjoyed Colorado every time I visited there. Uh, teaching classes. The first time I taught there, there was a store called the Happy Stamper in the uh, Cherry Creek, was it? District or whatever shopping area. And the last time I visited uh, Colorado, I taught from everywhere from Colorado Springs up to Cheyenne and a few stops in between, including Rocky Mountain National Park, which I was really glad to uh, be able to see on one of my visits there finally. All right, so um, warm tone scenes in this for a sunset scenario. So we're going to have a lot of different um, colors in this. I don't know exactly where this one is going though, to tell you the truth. But what I've done is I've grabbed a lot of different tones in here. Okay, so if we go like with sunsets, I can get the grassy area here in greens, okay? But if we're talking about more like twilight, you know, or something of that sort, then we're probably gonna move away from this a little bit. And that's what I'm kind of feeling like I'll do. Okay, but here's some other warm tones right here, all right? So this is what I usually had people do in my workshops in the past. Speaking of workshops, um, building out a range of tones like this. And then when we started coloring, we would just have them start off with the lightest tones and then work into the darker tones. Now there's two different kind of color schemes right here. Um, when we start moving into something like this, uh, actually this would probably be, the ochre would probably be more further down, like something like that. All right, but you can do this with whatever brand of pads you have. Okay, so let's say here's a mustard seed, here's a peeled paint, distress ink, you know, and then just moving down the line. Um, I'm guessing that this one's probably lighter than the peeled paint, but see, you can go like something like this and you're just putting together, you're, you're kind of breaking apart a range of values within a given color scheme. Here's um, memento, bamboo leaves. That would probably be something like this here. Okay, now you don't have to use all these. I'm just giving this, you know, showing this as an example here. So, um, what color to do? <laughs> that's, that's the big question here. All right, so I don't have to think about it too much because I'm going to give this a base layer of a universal tone and then I'll just kind of start developing things after that. So base layer colors, okay? So this one's, I've been using um, a warm tone, um, Peach Bellini. May, I should probably use that same one if the other two scenes are going to be, oh, somewhat compared to it or contra compare contrasted against it, the first two versions of this. So you can say that you know, in some ways the color schemes have something in common by using a common base layer amongst everything. So, hello CM, Jeannie, Diana, 
Good to see you all. Uh, you're in Colorado Springs. In Colorado Springs, I went to Pikes. What is that? Cave of the Winds and Garden of the Gods. <laughs> I I had a little bit of time before my first classes on some day. I don't know how how I had so much time. Um, oh, maybe I flew into town one day, uh, like a Thursday or something like that, or a Friday. And I think I I think I flew in, and we didn't schedule any classes. So I think after that, I did that trio of you know whatever. Uh, you know, uh, touristy types of sites. <laughs> well, those are awesome. I just remember my uh, rental car uh, brakes um, coming down off of pikes, you know, just um, having them kind of screech, you know, with, a, I don't know, whatever heat. So they have that... Um, I don't know, whatever, brake check area on the way down. All right, so, oh, I forgot. Okay, so this area up in the sky is going to be a little bit different. I could just do, I mean, there's very little sky area up here like that. Okay, so I'm going to put a little bit of texturing in here in the form of the cloud alto cumulus, and then... Um, I'll proceed from there. I'm thinking about throwing in some um, light beams into here as well. So let's see how that goes. I mean, yeah, I'm trying to think of kind of what direction I would put those in here, though. If I did, um, I don't know. It would be a pretty dominant um, visual here. So uh, I'm not quite sure if I want to go that far <laughs> in terms of creating something quite a bit different from the first two scenes. Okay, so let's see here. Okay, I didn't even know Pike's Peak. Okay, uh, you know, I'm out of it, I guess. I didn't even know you can drive to the top. So I was just driving and driving and driving. I'm thinking, oh my gosh, you know, I didn't know there'd be like a store at the top and a tram, you know, going up there and everything. It was just a good thing that, uh, you know, that I didn't have to be anywhere uh, the rest of that day. I think I set up or something like that. I set up my, uh, um, set up my, uh, uh, whatever, my workshop. Um, uh, workshop setup. Uh, I'm trying to remember the name of that store that I taught at there they were a store but then they were mostly um their main thing by the time i was teaching there was mostly they were wholesaling and retailing um i think it was brad's or something like that so they had these gigantic bags of uh brad's from whatever manufacturer they used to order those from and they were dividing them up into like smaller bags in the back I want to say the word Colorado was in their name too, um, their store, and um, I don't know if that was their manufacturing name as well, but I think it was. Um, it's probably going back 20 years or something like that. Oh, let's see here. Okay, so um, uh, the Peach Bellini here. Let's see if this. Um, is even still wet on here. Oh, it is. Good. Oh, and it looks like my ink has set up really well, I think, from yesterday. It's kind of nice um, having the imagery already stamped out here because um, the inks are nice and dry and uh, my desk here isn't so cluttered with um, stamps and everything like that. I'm not going to do it that way because people like to see... Um, you know, the whole process of stamping something out from start to finish, I think. Um, but I think I will do a lot more of the uh, stamp sketch videos and then follow up with the uh, the coloring like this. And I want to do more of this types of, I don't know, uh, more of these series of uh, videos showing um, 
some different uh, compositions, but just finished off differently, different color schemes or whatever. And I want to follow up with this, um, with these larger, um, you know, semi-gloss, you know, full color uh, versions of the scene with some smaller ones, like quick scenes, scenes that utilize the same imagery, but maybe stamped on different types of surfaces or just smaller versions of it, you know, that people, you know, where they can get the, uh, you know, they can get the gist of, uh, you can capture the gist of uh, the setting or whatever, but in a much faster, you know, uh, process. I don't know if it's faster process, you know, just, you know, doing smaller cards, it's going to be faster in general. Okay, so this mackerel sky, I'm going to be kind of adding in some streaks into here, and I'm going to leave some area white, just in case I do want to run um, some light beams coming across here. I think it might be, you know, fairly dramatic to have some light beams coming in here um, from probably right there. That seems to be in the natural location being that your eye kind of goes like that. So it would be right around in this spot. If this tree wasn't here, I'd probably follow it up by going like this and have this, my light beams coming from back there. I, I guess I could, I guess I can have it be, you know, back there and have it coming from behind the tree. Maybe that'll be a better idea than having it like a lighter area physically right here. Um, yeah. All right. So, these are these are just little adjustments, you know. I mean, if you just, I go if I go with one thing over another, it's not really going to matter uh, too much. It's just you know, those are little just tweaks. It's not like oh my gosh, I, I put it in the wrong spot, you know, it, for any of us. Okay, all right. So what I'm doing here is I'm oscillating light and dark, and I'm coloring things. Yeah, but um, I'm also the biggest thing that I'm doing right here is establishing. Um, kind of the general lighting scheme of the scene. So especially down here on this road, we're going with a kind of an oscillation of light and dark. It's a little bit darker, lighter, dark, light, you know, because I'm putting these streaks across in here. Okay, now this is starting to get in this forested section. So we'll go a little bit darker in here. So see, going with these lighter tones like this allows you to you kind of make some decisions um, or establish things. I don't know if I made decisions. I just, as I started coloring in here, certain things, you know, were remaining light and I'm just looking at it thinking, okay, do I want to, you know, have it light still or do I want to tone over the top of it? You know, so um, a lot of things are just kind of happening um, I wouldn't say by chance, but it, you know, a lot of it is random. Um, things that are in darker areas, I put them in shadows, like at the base of things. Those areas right there, I don't leave this light, okay? Because I'd like to anchor in my imagery into the scenes, but we're talking about this whole big open area, you know what I mean? It's there are there aren't specific areas that I think should be light and other areas, you know, that should be dark. It's just, like I said, it's an oscillation of it. It's like checkerboarding, as I say. So, yeah. Hello, Linda B. Good to see you. You might have mentioned that before, Linda. That sounds familiar. Yeah. When I, when I drove down to Colorado Springs from, you know, I flew into Denver. I didn't fly into Colorado Springs. Um, this was probably, I don't know, it was close to 20 years ago or something like that. But it occurred to me that on that drive, I was thinking all those houses and shopping centers and communities between Denver and Colorado Springs, those things looked like all of them looked to me like they were built at that time within the last like five years, like I said, at that time. I was thinking, man, that whole area is going to be just like filled in uh, eventually between Colorado Springs and uh, Denver. 
closer to Denver, of course, but man, I was saying there is a lot of uh, a lot of construction going on. That's one of those things that struck me at that time, you know. Um, but believe it or not, there was a stamp convention one time in Colorado Springs. I don't know if there's been since, but um, I remember there was one probably around... Oh, 2005, maybe. Um, there were, you know, there were already conventions in Denver and uh, Fort Collins um, that were regular. I, I don't know if they were regular shows. Um, I don't know how many went on in uh, Fort Collins, but um, the Colorado Springs one kind of surprised me. Um, that they would have one of the shows there. There, there were just shows going on everywhere. Um, I mean, Colorado Springs was more of a natural sp place than uh, I think it was. I don't know if it was Anchorage, Alaska. <laughs> that was the one that was always the most unusual to me in terms of the location. Yeah, you know, because I was thinking, how many stampers are there in you know the entire state? of Alaska. Needless to say, they didn't have too many um, in Alaska. After that, if any, um, but it was a pretty popular one to do, relatively speaking, um, for the vendors, you know, because the vendors, I think, just they looked at it like a, you know, kind of like taking a vacation, um, but being able to write it off. Needless to say, I don't think too many people were driving um, to the location. A lot of uh, stamp cruises, though, to Alaska, that's for sure. I get invited to uh, I don't know, one or two of those. I, I, ne I can never make it, though, because I can never be gone for that long. I would have had to have been gone for like two weeks or something like that. And I can never take off that amount of time back in the day. Okay, so this is our base layer color scheme, and that is basically the same foundation layer of colors that were utilized on this as well as this okay can you see the I don't know if you can see it but can you see kind of the base layer um, general color schemes you can see these streaks going across here I mean you know these ones take on a different kind of character um, with you know, the other colors to come over the top of it, but even the blue tone scene, can you see the warmer tones kind of, oh, kind of influencing, you know, an overall very dominant blue toned cool color scheme in here. Now I've added in a little bit more of a, like some green touches in here, but you can see that kind of brownish tinge showing through all of these different areas in here. And it just makes for, you know, a little bit more of a, a rich, um, and a, a range, a uh, temperature range, I guess you can say, um, as well as hue, you know what I mean? When you add in just blues, I think that looks pretty good, but just having that warmer tinge somewhere, I, th I think really helps it out. Now this one's going to be, look quite a bit different when I spray seal it. You know, these trees are going to be much deeper. There's going to be much deeper blues being revealed through the spray sealing. But anyways, you can see the, uh, you know, the, the influence of this base layer color scheme. And again, it's not a big commitment to 
light and dark. I mean, you can still alter it. They, these aren't so dark in here where it's like, oh my God, I, you know, I colored that all in. Maybe that's too dark or something like that. No, it's not because you're going to bring in all these other different colors into the mix. And uh, those ones will be the things that really establish the, uh, the lighting scheme of it all. So hello, Linda D. It's nearly filled. That's what I figured, Don. I, I thought at that rate right there, I was thinking uh, over the years, that whole area is probably filled in. All right, so, okay, now this is where um, I'm not quite certain of where to go in terms of, my, you know, when we say it's sunsets, you know, sunsets look, can look quite a bit different from one another. You can go with, you know, super saturated, you know, warm tone where it's like, you know, there's golden light everywhere. You know, they call it the, like the golden hour, right, in photography. Um, and then there's, um, yeah, there's times, there's lighting where the, the landscape doesn't change too much, but you have a lot of it in the sky. Um, kind of a little bit more muted tones, maybe. Um, different colors in the uh, the sky as well so i think i'm going to let's just go with the mustard right now mustard seed okay um and let's just see how that's looking if it starts to look too yellowish then we'll bring in you know we'll bring in um, a stronger influence of some greens but the mustard seed is kind of I wouldn't say it's neutral. It's, you know, it has some uh, orange in it. You know, this is more of a neutral yellow like this. Um, it doesn't have, you know, greens or oranges in it. Um, but this one's not so dark, though, you know, the mustard seed, that um, you can't kind of manipulate it and change it around. Okay, so one of the things I'm going to do, which I didn't do on the previous ones because of the color schemes, is I didn't bring in so many yellows, so... But we'll have a little bit more of a golden light in here, so I'm going to add this into the shadows. Okay... Going into the skies, I generally like my sky areas to be, um, or not just the sky areas, but the uh, top left and right corners to be pretty saturated too. Um, to create a vignette effect and to really um, Kind of frame things off, okay? And that'll be the same thing with the bottom left and right corner. Now, sometimes what <clears throat> I tell people that um, in sunset types of scenarios, if you have a really colorful sky, the water usually isn't blue. It's usually reflecting the colors of the sky. So I have a little bit of this water area in here. I'm not sure if I want to have that reflecting that up there if I do want it separate, you know, just so it's not, everything's not so kind of monochromatic in here. I, th I think I do, I think I do want some other changes in hue kind of going on in here rather than just have everything kind of warm, warmly lit. It'll be, you know, if these are greens in here and these are browns in here, it'll be warm browns and warm greens, though. Um, but we'll see how we get, you know, how far we get here. I was looking at, um, someone posted a, a photo, I think it was on, must have been on Flickr or something like that, that uh, Garden of the Gods area down there in uh, 
Colorado Springs and uh but it was it was like dusted in snow, so I hadn't seen too many photographs of that, you know, like time of year like that, which is really cool to see. For those that don't know, all right, well, you can look at it. It's like Garden of the Gods, whatever, Colorado Springs, and uh, a lot of these red rock, you know, really cool, brightly kind of rust-colored uh, rock formations in this, I don't know, a relatively small area. And then I always like caves and things like that. Um, I was always kind of dipping down into kind of abandoned mines and things like that in my day. <laughs> so I wasn't used to going to like a cave of the winds and going like on tour, uh, but it was still cool. All right, so this is yellow, so yellow is going to be fairly neutral, so we'll start moving into the greens in here uh, pretty soon, and the browns in this area. I'm thinking I can go with more yellow, though. I'm kind of, I'm, I don't know, I'm kind of holding back on here, because I usually don't go into, the, like, you know, this area with so much yellow, but I want this one to be really warm and... Kind of inviting and whatnot but i think i'm being a little bit conservative here just because i don't want to go too dark uh on here the lighter you have it kind of the more you can kind of manipulate things when you get to other things like you know alcohol pens or colored pencils or something like that so uh, yeah I guess I, I don't know. I, I guess I don't do too many uh, sunsetty types of um, color schemes. I do it, you know, when there's like a full sky or something like that, and then I'm putting dark trees in front of it or something of that sort. But I, I don't think I, I don't know. I don't think I do too many uh, sunsetty types of things where the, it's predominantly, I don't know, whatever it's like, eighty percent, you know, landscape in here. I like having skies. Uh, Sun City skies reflecting off bodies of water, you know, that type of thing. But this one's a little bit different here for me. So I'm not exactly sure which way I want to go with it. Um, all right, so that being said, let's stop right there and let's start defining some of the, uh, you know, the general... Um, color schemes um, and objects in here. Color scheme areas and objects, okay? So a lot of times I'm dealing with like smaller areas, like, okay, here's the meadow or something like that. But we have these <laughs> like gigantic objects within that space, so they're not going to be the same colors like the meadow. Okay, so let's start moving it into, let's go with the brown here. Let's go with the walnut stain um, in here. And the walnut stain is not a dark color, but it's, you know, it's fairly light. Maybe this is too light here. I can't even see it. But it's not bad, again, to start off with lighter versions of whatever color scheme you're working with, going back to that whole idea of just kind of, you know, laying out um, a color scheme and lining up from light to dark like this. This is, this is not black. This is a dark brown right here. All right, so that being said, let's go to... <laughs> Here, rich. Let's go to this rich cocoa here. I'm hesitating because I know this one is like super bright. Okay, probably doesn't look like it, but it really is. So let's go into this kind of a uh, intermediate tone in between that one and the brown right now. 
this is brown. That's just the Marvy name for that one. It's like their generic brown color. See that right there? It's like changing ever so slowly. Um, you can jump into darker tones and things that are much more visible and, you know, make more of like a instant impact, but you're going to benefit, especially if you spray seal these, okay? If you spray seal these, you'll benefit from all these different transparent layers of tone that you add down there. It'll just look much deeper, okay? Now some, you know, I get it though. It's like, uh, hey, you know, I don't have time to work through, you know, whatever, eight colors on, on my tree trunks or something like that. But, um, you know, you can do it with like three or four or something like that. It just, th this way, is, I, I find this to be really easy this way. Um, just because I, I'm not taking big jumps from in value from something really light to something darker. Okay, so if I put, if let's say if I just went in straight with brown on top of white, you know, it's going to be, you know, a fairly dark and, you know, deep contrast right there. So, I mean, you can you can go in and layer this onto, you know, a tree trunk like that, you know, without getting like harsh marks or something like that. But this just blends really nicely. We already have a lot of tone laid down. I can go like this, right? You can use the worst technique possible, but because you're adding wet ink into a moist surface like this, you know, if I go like that on here, that's not going to blend out, right? But on this paper right here, that's kind of wet on the damp on the surface and starting to achieve a little bit of a kind of, I don't know, almost super saturation in the pulp of the paper. You can go like this, right? and just blend it right in and it's not going to be any problem. So that's where um, kind of blending ease, but also, you know, just for color depth comes into play. So just make it easier for yourself if you have the time, you know, to do that. And this isn't glossy cardstock either. It's just semi-gloss. So, you know, see, this is how it is. This is on a blank piece of paper. Okay, so this is coated on both sides, right? But this is the semi-gloss like that. If I go like that, that's not really blending out, right? So you can see, I mean, it's the same thing on this side, but now I have a bunch of inks. So this makes it really easy. I can go like that. That's not good technique, but that just blends right in like that. And there's, again, the benefit of kind of those base layer colors. It kind of moistens the paper and it makes it easy to really just blend these around in a nice, um, I don't know, uh, easy, easy method. Uh, hello, Annie. Good to see you. Linda was at Garden of the Gods, yeah. If you're in Colorado Springs, I think you pretty much have to go. Is it, I think it's a law that you have to go to Garden of the Gods and Pikes, at least. Maybe you don't go to Cave of the Winds, I don't know. Um, but uh, yeah, Garden of the Gods and, uh, and uh, Pikes. <laughs> Unless you're, you know, Unless you're from Denver, then you you know what I mean? You don't need to go to, you know, those, those locations. You probably can go into Garden of the Gods at least though. But going to see like a, you know, 14,000, you know, foot peak, you, you know what I mean? That's old, old news to uh, people out in Colorado. Like I hadn't gone to, I, I lived in Huntington Beach for years and uh, like Disneyland was, uh, I don't know, 30 minutes away on surface streets, basically. And I, at one time, I hadn't been to uh, Disneyland in, I don't know, what it was, 15 years or something like that. All right, so adding that in like that, going a little bit on the, um, uh, the corners for that vignette. 
this is a pretty rich brown tone right here. So let's add some of that. I'm kind of sticking with my general uh, kind of areas that I've added that streak across the road with, with the uh, base layer colors. I'm still trying to think of that name of that store that I went to. I only taught at, I think I only taught at one store in Colorado Springs. I might have taught at two though, now that I think about it. I'm not sure. So I taught in, uh, I don't know, all over, all over the Denver area. There were so many uh, stores there, Happy Stamper, um, the great, some, I can't remember, Rocky something stamp store. There were stores and um, it's like every, you know, city suburb in that Denver area seemed to have a store at one time. Aurora, you know, I'm trying to remember of a bunch of other ones, but the one place that I didn't make it out to, you know, where there were stores periodically in Colorado was um, was in Grand Junction. I had, I don't know, several, there were several stores, not at the same time, but over the years that carried uh, um, the Stampscape line. All right, see this right here? I'm kind of dabbing some of this brown over the top of that bridge, making it more, look a little bit more dimensional. See all these little bits like that. It's coming off of my paper towel here. Maybe this paper towel served its purpose. Well, at least that area of it. So you just go like this and you have your new um, ink applicator like that. Just kind of smash it down so it's not so textured. It's beautiful. I just wish it wasn't so crowded. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, I totally get that. Um, it seems like in California, it's gotten crowded everywhere. I, I loved Huntington Beach, um, but that by the time I was moving out of there around 2002, um, I, th I think right after that too, like when the, it, while I was living there, I lived there for like 10 years or something like that. And, um, there were a lot of open spaces there still. And then by the time I moved, it's like every open space got filled up. And then when I moved from there, like got even crazier. Everything got um, really built out. Um, a lot more people, a lot more crowded. Yeah. And by that with everything, it's like, um, uh, I used to go hiking a lot and camping and, um, I'm glad that people are visiting, you know, the national parks and everything like that now, but man, I, I go to these places and it's like, used to just drive right in, but there might be a line backed up, you know, it might take me, I don't know, half an hour, 40 minutes just to get into the park. All right, so a little bit more tone up top there. I think I've kind of, I've ditched the idea of the light beams because I got rid of like, well, I guess I could do it right here. Um, you know, I almost got rid of all the, uh, the, the white up there. It's like the more tone that I keep adding, it's like, okay, it's sunset. It's moving towards twilight. Oh, okay, now it's twilight. <laughs> And it gives it, it might keep getting darker and darker. And it's like, okay, we're past twilight. You know, it's almost like night, you know. I don't know if I'm going to go that far, but that can happen. All right, so that was some pink there. Let's go to the dark brown here. And that's going to really start developing 
um, the shadows for my trees. Okay. This, uh, your, if I was doing this on glossy cardstock, um, you'd get a much deeper, richer saturation um, because the inks stay a lot more um, surface oriented, okay? So dye-based inks work by staining, okay? So what they're doing here, but they're a little bit more absorbent on this. Okay, so that's what glossy cardstock would look like, okay? But that's because this is still wet, okay? But it still looks pretty good. Do you see this kind of warm kind of glow happening within there? That's going to dry dull, okay? But you just spray seal it and then it should um, revert back to how it looks when it's been freshly, the inks are freshly applied. But what I want to get at right here is again, this is just straight brown right here, okay? Just sell you on the idea of, you know, the difference between <laughs> this and just straight brown that's why i don't skip those you know i you know i add those base layer colors in there just you know because it, it the, you know, the the color schemes and the surfaces and everything like that that just looks so much richer um as a result and again it just makes it it makes the um the process so much more user friendly you know what i mean you can go like Again, if I just go like this, just on a you know blank piece of paper, that's not really spreading around. So this paper right now is really kind of moist for me. So when I get into my darker tones, which would stand to give me you know the worst looks if I use bad technique, if I go like this right there, that just spreads right out for me. Okay. So okay, so if you're in you know really arid terrain and your inks are drying on you really fast and you can't go, you know, you can't spread your inks around very much. They're really kind of, you know, applying and drying really fast. Then go back with your lightest tone again, you know, your base layer colors and just color over everything again and re-moisten the paper. Don't kind of moisten with the darker tone. Just go back with your lighter tones and uh, reapply as needed. You know, it's like re kind of lubricating the page or something like that. You might see it as doing. All right, let's see. Bottom left and right corners. I'm kind of really developing my browns right now. I'll go in and get the, uh, the, um, the greens in here shortly. Thing as I'm doing this, I'm debating on whether or not I want to use this paper towel to get this tree because it's kind of narrow. I don't want to, you know, over apply. Here, I'll try to get some of it down here because this is going to be faster than, you know, like colored pencils or something. shadow work right in here okay this is dark brown the black is the thing that's really going to uh, you know define the um, the shadow areas and to kind of bring everything together but this brown is it's it's right up there though <laughs> in terms of colors that can colors that can do that too it's pretty it's pretty dark i really like um having a, a nice range of uh, brown tones and blue tones typically so when i can find a, a really good um, brown um i use those ones a lot i think what is it with the distress isn't there like one ground espresso okay i have this maybe i should try this one here let me see, am I done with this one? I'm trying to remember if this one was darker here. I don't have the pad for it, so I just bought the reinker. If I do like this color brown though, um, yeah, that one's really dark. 
it's darker than I think the dark brown. Uh, dark brown Marvy. Boy, this one is really dark. I need to use this one more often. Or maybe I should get the pad for it because I could see myself stamping out imagery in this color. So, you know, when you're thinking about getting pads and things like that, um, with the pads that you're not using for impressions and you just want to color with it, I would just suggest getting, unless you have a lot of room for it or whatever, but I, I would just suggest getting the re-inkers for them. And then the pads where you're, you know, you're going to be making impressions from that color, then, you know, get the, uh, um, uh, the pad for it. But most of the new kind of ink colors that I've bought, I just bought the um, the reinkers for them. A lot of the stress ink colors. Um, oh, what else? Memento. Maybe not the memento. Eh, I'm trying to think of if I bought any mementos where I don't have the pad for it. All right, so that is the brown there, okay? So looking pretty anemic, but we haven't even started with those um, green tones yet. And we need to really address this area up here. Um, that area might up there might be better with um, alcohol inks and colored pencils, just because I can get into there um, a lot more, you know, specifically in, in areas. Oh, if you had a huge influx of people from California with COVID, um, during that lockdown, it's because everyone was able to uh, work remotely, or a lot of people were able to work remotely. So you had a lot of people, you know, like in the tech industry and stuff like that, uh, moving to like, you know, Montana or, you know what I mean? Stuff like that, places like that. But I don't know. I'll tell you, though. I don't know of any uh, state where you have more people moving into it than California, though. Everyone's moving to California from all over the globe, especially Southern California. People aren't moving to, like, you know, I don't think there's a huge influx of people moving to, like, you know, uh, Redding or something like that. Maybe now, you know. People are moving out of certain areas of California and moving to other areas of it possibly too. But, um, you know, Eureka, you know, that Northern California, Southern Oregon area. Which I, I love that area up there. Um, what was that town? Um, Southern Oregon. Uh, where they had that Shakespeare, not the Shakespeare, Shakespeare Festival? Ashland. <laughs> that town right there, I love that place. I just drove through there once um, when driving up to a convention in, uh, in Washington. All right, this is ochre. Look how, look how warm that is. My God, I got to be careful with this one. This one's super bright. All right, that changed the entire spirit of this scene, didn't it? It's because we jacked up the intensity, um, like, greatly. Okay. Wow. Look at that. That looks much more sunsity up there in the sky. I don't know. Looks like this ochre is going to play a big role in in the uh, the intensity range of this scene. All right, there we have that. That grass is going to have to uh, kind of match some of that intensity. 
Although it's going, you know, the grass is going to look really anemic. So we'll add some of this ochre into this grassy area right in here. Okay, Whew. that is intense right there, huh? All right, let's move into the greens. You see that black? It's, you know, some of it's coming off on my uh, applicator here. There's one, one shop left in the springs. The rest are big box stores. That's pretty much... I, I would say, I was going to say that's kind of the case with a lot of areas, but a lot of areas don't have like any, um, like independent stores anymore. Um, nationwide, unfortunately. If there are, and you like them, try to support them as much as possible. The thing about that was great about the uh, stores was always, you know, it's always the community aspect of it, you know, just meeting people and, you know, people have clubs and they see each other in workshops all the time or in stores, you know, the store owners, you know, um, customers were all friends, everything like that. Um, I knew some stores um, that uh, that used to charter like buses sometimes to go to like conventions together. Um, one of them was uh, the early days of the Carson. They call it the original rubber stamp convention because that was the first one, but um, this one. Uh, store called Lady and the Stamp. <laughs> um, she used to uh, get a bus from uh, Fullerton just to drive over to Carson, which wasn't very far. I mean, it's like a, you know, it's like a like a 30 minute drive, but she still did that. They all kind of met out in the, uh, the parking lot at Lady and the Stamp and, you know, drove over, you know, took the um, bus over to uh to carson i guess it was less of a hassle too because in carson those days that show was just so huge that sometimes you and it was it wasn't held at like in a formal like convention center it was more of a community center it was carson community center you know where they you know they have a lot like weddings and things like that going on um you know, there were church services in certain rooms there. It wasn't like a big convention. So, you know, there weren't a lot of, uh, it wasn't, it probably wasn't, it wasn't designed for the size that the Carson show got to eventually. So um, the, that show, um, they used to have to have this shuttle bus going from this parking lot, this Ikea parking lot that was like on the other side of the freeway, you know. And I've, I think I've asked before, there was someone that was on a live stream once and I asked them if they ever took that, that you know, they used to say they used to go to that um, Carson show and I asked them if they ever had to take the shuttle bus. <laughs> but anyways, yeah, speaking of stores, you know, uh, it reminds me of all those kind of fun things that, uh, you know, stores, you know, would be doing, you know, in terms of kind of the community aspect of it. And, most stores that I knew um, had um, stamp clubs. For some reason, they were always on Tuesday nights. It seemed. Does anyone has was anyone ever in a in or are you in a stamp club? When I used to travel around um, talking to people in in my workshops, you know, we'd talk about various things or whatever, or at conventions, and. Um, I don't know, when clubs would come up, I, I would ask them when they were. And it seemed like they were always on Tuesday nights, like 90% of them. 
And a lot of times it was like on the, uh, I think we met on the second Tuesday of every month or something like that. This is the Huntington Beach Stamp Club. Years ago, but um, people used to, um, I used to see people at the Carson show, Carson convention from that stamp club. And they were meeting like, still meeting like 20 years later, you know, a few of the, a few of the, uh, I mean, the, the venue changed, you know, several times over that time. But um, yeah, I don't know. People were still meeting up and having fun. All right, so that is my green tones there. Um, I'm still not sure which direction this is going to be going. It might just be a warmer version of that first scene that I did. I don't want it looking too similar, though. Like that. See that right there? I guess it's different enough at this point in time, and then it's going to change more kind of more and more here so yeah all right the ochre the ochre characteristics i guess all right so that was peeled paint all right let's boy this one right here i'm kind of wondering about let's go okay so the marvy inks um okay i pulled out these um, mementos right here too because I just know that um, if I use this one, this one is super, super bright right here. It's that light green. But let's move through these um, duller versions first, okay? Not duller in terms of uh, like visual interest, but duller in terms of um, intensity. Just because, again, they're just so much easier to use as an intermediate tone moving into either darker or brighter tones. If you can move through these, um, they just, your your color schemes are going to um, kind of develop its color schemes and intensity schemes too, as well as value schemes. Um, they're going to develop nice and slowly for you, and then you'll have a lot of control over it. In fact, I mean, I can barely see anything kind of happening um, with a lot of these changes in color, okay? It's just like barely visible, but cumulatively, you know, it's like, oh, okay, you know, things did get darker and darker. Now, some of them, yeah, some of them, if you can't see anything happening at all, then just move on to your next tone. That one was, this one's the bamboo leaves here. Let's get some of this green going in, in some of this brown as well, just so it's not so, you know, foreign of a color within that area. This area is going to get kind of black in here or really dark. So let's just kind of build it up so we have a much richer um, kind of dark area than kind of flat, you know. All right. That was bamboo leaves there. Yeah, walnut stain. That's one of my favorite colors. I need to get the reinker for the walnut stain. Yeah, that ochre really changed it. Oh, CM. Okay, so this is yellow green. All right, this, that's lighter than this color right here, so I need to switch off here. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I already went really green up into my trees. I need, I'm gonna bring, I'm gonna try to alter that um, up there to bring in some more of my fall tones because I forgot that's one of those things I was thinking about doing um, initially. So let's hit that area up in there with some orange tones. Okay. Well, let, let's work through the green first. Let's see, this one is celery. This one's not going to make any difference at this point in time because it's already darker than the celery down there. All right, that is that. Jungle green. Let's see if that's a little bit darker. Eh, it's a little bit darker. Okay. Dark region, adding it up right up the trunk.
Can you see this tree starting to dry right here? You can tell it, uh, this is, you can see where it's drier right there. I mean, I don't know if you can tell um, looking at the screen right here, but the, it's drying dull. It's drying kind of flat. So the only colors that don't really dry too flat, I find, are Marvy tones. But again, the great equalizer for all of that, if you want it to look nice and vibrant and rich, you just spray seal it. All right. careful about this because it, 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 it can be it's like really kind of a almost like a neon green it is a really great color though and it adds to it's like as bright as um, ochre is you know so it can really brighten things up but it can really dominate too so I like to add things like my browns into it. The browns are already underneath it though. Um, and I like to mute it out with things like paint pens and uh, the white pigment ink um, touches. But let's add that in there because I do want some brighter tones happening in here. I really want this to be kind of an overall super vibrant, rich, deep, saturated uh, color scheme in here. Um, just to contrast it against, you know, the other two that have come to. All right, let's go into our trees now and let's try to add in some fall colors into those. Um, with those kind of lime green colors in there. Those are still, you can still manipulate those and move them into kind of your orangish tinges because you get that kind of color combination in those types of deciduous trees anyways, where, you know, the whole tree hasn't turned yet. You know, you still have some greens in them. Uh, let's see, which ones should I use though? Um, Let's go back to that ochre up there. Let's use some more of that ochre up there in those trees. that is that see it's already kind of turning you know that orangish tinge okay let's move into some orange here it might be better to if i do it with the uh, alcohol pens you know this isn't like the you know the ideal kind of like a tip here you know wadded up paper towel for kind of doing like little detail-y types you know applications I mean, it's not bad, but... All right, let's add some of this down in this grass here too. Sometimes you get kind of those same types of uh, little touches of uh, color in uh, ground cover as well as in the trees during fall, right? Let's add a little bit down here into this 
road here just to, I don't want it orange, but I'm just kind of warming it up a little bit like that, just to create a little bit of a, I don't know, whatever visual relationship down here, you know, as up here. Let's bring some of this into our sky as well. It's a little bit warmer. My fingers are getting inky. All right, this is terracotta. Hmm. All right. Oh, that adds quite a bit of a difference in hue. All right, see this orangish tinge, you know what I mean? We've gone into fall, I guess, here. I'm trying to keep this off of the uh, the rooftop here too, so I'll get a, a little bit closer in there with, um, with the alcohol pens and such. Okay, that's looking a little I need a little bit of this orange down here and this green. You know, just to, so it's not quite so whatever stark of a, of a color change. Okay, here's the terracotta down here too. I'm going in with a really dry touch in here, but if you go over it enough, you can, you know, bring out some of that tone a brighter version of that tone like that. See that right there? I mean, see, I mean, you can leave that white if you want to really make an impact in terms of this super strong visual lead in, but I, it, um, I usually don't do that. Um, it's, a, it's a little bit more natural. I just left a big fingerprint right there. That'll be just covered up with my, uh, paint pens. Hello, Shelly. Yeah, Shelly, we'll have like, I'll schedule one of these uh, or regular times um, at least once a week for some sort of a um, live streams, I think. But we're doing this in a warm toned autumn kind of sunsetty uh color scheme right here if that is or not i don't know that's what it that's what it's supposed to represent but okay look at this you're, you're seeing all that glare coming off doesn't that look better this is all glary right here i know from all my lights but uh and the, the inks are really wet right now but um yeah. Okay. So I'm pretty happy with the uh, with the color schemes right here right now. Let's go in and let's get more a lot more detailed. And uh, okay. So I didn't. Okay. I need to apply one more thing here before I get in get to my um, alcohol inks, and that is black. Okay. Because once you lay down the alcohol inks and especially the colored pencils, I don't find the application of dye-based, you know, water-based dyes to go over the tops of those types of inks very well. So you got to take care of like your water-based stuff first. I'm not talking about the pigment inks because that's um, th a thicker ink and that goes right over the top of anything. But let's go with the black here and let's really um, push the shading where we want it to go. Okay, so on this tree right here, we're shading what's basically the left-hand side of it. Okay. I'm not making a, a super hard line right here. It's darker over here, and then it's a little bit lighter right here. And then this um, right side of it will be lightest, so it's transitioning from dark to light like that. Okay. 
But see, there's black right there. And you can see the difference between this one and this one. Maybe this one will be a little bit lighter, I don't know. And I just, I don't mask anything off. I just, you know, the, those trees and everything like that, that texturing is showing right in that um, tree, but I, I don't really worry about that. Um, I think the tree gets, whatever, rendered enough with tone over the top of it. I'm not really aware of that um, thing. And plus, you know what I mean, uh, to, to mask everything off, I mean, that would be better. You know what I mean? So people do that. I mean, it, it's a good exercise to do, but, uh, you know, I'm just, you know, it takes more time to do uh, something like that. So I just tone things in and, you know, don't, um, I don't use those, uh, like, good stamping habits. <laughs> I don't employ those, you know what I mean? Good stamping habits if they're time consuming. And if and if it's just not going to matter enough to me, you know what I mean? There might be some people that say, hey, I can see that tree right through there. And then for them, I would recommend like a liquid frisk or something like that. <laughs> You know, the, the, like liquid masking uh, materials. Okay, so uh, adding some shading in here, kind of anchoring down my trees a little bit more. See, when you add that kind of shadow right in here, you know, it makes the tree kind of sit in the scene um, more. It gives it uh, visual weight and opacity. Um, Plus, I just, I just like it when um, you have your objects kind of um, affecting the area, uh, area, surfaces, whatever, in which, you know, the space in which they represent, okay? I guess the opacity in which they represent, too. If you don't have any shadow over here, and if it's back, being backlit, then you're saying basically the tree is almost like like invisible in some ways, or re really translucent, I guess. So just anchor it down, and it really, uh, I don't know, it kind of, it kind of frames off the, uh, the scene a little bit more too. If you make this a little bit darker, these other areas in here around it will seem a little bit lighter by contrast. All right, so that being said, let's make a little bit more contrast uh in our skies and strengthen the vignette okay all right i think that is it with the black dye base ink at least Uh, yeah, you you mean this uh, scene right here? You could with the uh, lightning. Oh, yeah, if someone mentioned lightning. That would be a dramatic scene like that. Where I can find rubber ra uh, rubber raft stamp, the big whitewater rafting raft that usually holds. I used to see someone had something like that at one time. Um, I don't know what company had it but I know I've seen a whitewater raft before somewhere. Um, I want to say it was uh, Visions of Ink, but, but I'm not sure. Anyone remember that company, Visions of Ink? <laughs> if you do, you've been stamping for a really long time. All right. Let's see. Okay, so um, let me grab some pens here. This is the these are the pens that I didn't the media that I didn't grab before I started this. Um, I grabbed everything else. I grabbed all my uh, 
things like paint pens in the color scheme that I'd be working in. Um, I didn't grab my markers though. I wasn't really quite sure of what colors I was going to be using there or how this was going to look. But we've used pinks and kind of beige-ish tones, oranges, ochres. I don't want to go with anything too kind of crazy. Um, bright, I don't think. But let's go in here like this. Okay, so let's bring in a little bit more pink into the skies. This My ink up here, my dye based ink is so wet. I just, I pulled this through like a puddle of uh, ink and it just separated it. So, I mean, it's just because it's wet. Um, this alcohol ink is not putting my trees back into solution. My dye-based inks back into solution. It's just that this surface is just so wet right now. All right, this is, that's a little bit too bright of a pink here. I need a, a duller pink. Uh, let's try this one. Yeah, okay. Still not super bright, but I want to bring in some of this pink down into this area so that you get a little bit of this um, tinge. It might have been better to do it with the, the dye base stinks or something like that, but I just want to bring some of that color um, that would be the same as the lighting that's being cast in the scene. So we're assuming that this is a warm tone kind of sunset. So that colors, the colors of that color scheme are being cast you know, down amongst the, on the landscape. Okay, so <clears throat> let's go into this bridge. This bridge needs to be addressed. This is like a super light apricot. I'm using like the same colors that I have the past couple of days, but they're pretty universal in terms of base layer colors. Um, Biscuit. <laughs> okay, I'm kind of building it up here. I I, I can bar I really barely see anything that's happening, but what I'm doing is I'm establishing a little bit of a base layer of this type of ink, so that when I go into my darker ones, it'll kind of blend around um, easier than if I'm doing it on a dry piece of paper. Okay, where it's just like you know, like stuck. You know, you're stuck with that color. Okay, so let's go with the pinks right here. Okay, I'm using some of this pink in these trees. The pink, it doesn't read as pink. It's because it's, I'm putting it over the top of, um, you know, whatever, ochres, oranges, all those different colors in there. And I, I do want to get you know, kind of more of those fall-ish looking colors back in there, a little bit deeper, okay? So there's a little bit of pink down here. That's a little bit too much. Let me go back to my lighter one and just kind of blend that out. With these pens too, with alcohol, of course, you can kind of remove, you know, some of the ink that you've applied if you want to. Just like a using like a blender pen. All right, let's see. Um, yellow. Okay, these are kind of just layering additional tones down. As I'm doing this, you know, I'm kind of um, 
thing that's going through in my mind is I'm just kind of, I really want to get to certain colors, but I'm a little bit hesitant. So uh, just because of the sheer amount of brightness, like this red and things like that. So <laughs> I do these things to make it easier for me. So it's like when I apply it, um, I could remove it if need be, which is often the case, or I, I need to kind of really blend it and spread it around. Like, see that red right there? So I went through all of that other type of um, color layering in there because now I'm applying that red, which is shockingly, you know, bright and uh, very, very visible. I'm applying it over the top of other alcohol um, layers so that it's not just absorbing into the paper and it's going to make it hard to kind of manipulate. So let's go with that and let's go back in with one of the lighter colors. Um, let's go with yellow here, okay? And we'll blend that around and it's dissolving the red and uh, it's mixing with the yellow to form kind of some orangish tinges, various values. But the big the big point is that you can um, you can manipulate it, <laughs> and I guess you can remove it if need be. I don't know if you can remove it a hundred percent, but um, you can take off quite a bit of it. But you can really dull it down. It's super, super bright, though. This is also where, this is also kind of the point where in your scene, um, using all this alcohol ink on here, you know, that alcohol dries real shiny. It's, you're going to, um, the surface is start, going to start looking kind of a little bit, um, I don't know, whatever, separated in terms of, um, I don't know, whatever surface quality. And uh, one thing's going to look really shiny. And with the drying of the dye based inks on the trees, they're going to look really quite dull. But that, again, that's where, you know, we'll unify it more with the, um, we'll unify it with, uh, you know, spray sealant. All right, so that is in those trees. This is how this is looking right here, like that. They're super bright up there. That, you know, that um, bridge is not looking super bright. So we'll try to bring in some more, a uh, little bit more intensity down into those greens. Let's see here. So you're going to intensify it or bring intensity into it. And then we're... <laughs> And then you dull it all back, you know, with the use of some white pigment ink uh, towards the end, you know, just so it's not so crazy busy in terms of the uh, the intensity, the brightness, uh, uh, whatever scheme. All right, I'm going green with a kind of a lime green down here, which is a very bright lime green in the alcohol pen. Let's bring some of that, let's introduce some of that green back into these trees too, I think. Okay. Add that down like that, and then we'll spread it around more. or blended in. All right, now, huh. See, Karen said her husband gave me the CV for Christmas, so I'm 
isolated in my room. <laughs> You've lost all sense of uh, day and time. Um, I know the feeling. <laughs> okay, let's see. Um... the the bridge see what when, when things start kind of overall when you start changing the values of things um, the intensities of things the you know the overall brightness um, you can bring everything else along because you're establishing while doing that, that that's kind of the norm for the scene. You know, I mean, if I added that amount of brightness, like in my first um, scene that I did, it just wouldn't match. But um, everything else is kind of taken on a, you know, a certain degree of, a, well, I don't know, whatever, you know, on the intensity scale. Um, so I'm able to go in with these, I don't know, these layers of a, tone with these pens here and it's not looking um, out of place on this bridge now okay I'm going down a little bit of green in there on my bridge believe it or not I'm going down here with the trees I don't want green trees but um, I'm just adding another layer in here Okay. Um, I'm just grabbing any pens kind of, I'm just looking, I'm looking for generally for um, the value range and if it's within that color scheme, okay, I'm not looking for, oh, I need that like one specific color or something like that. They're all just kind of within the same color families and I'm just kind of manipulating it from light and dark that's almost like too dark <laughs> actually that might not be bad though see i'll add this darker brown like right underneath the eaves like that and then it stands out a little bit too much and then you just go in there and you just kind of blend it out like that so again you've kind of established um kind of that layering of that same medium you know the dye based things it's you know it's water you know, the water-based inks, um, but the alcohol, you just get a good kind of layering with alcohol down in your lighter tones. And you can just go and blend right on top of them with the darker tones that you're applying with ease where, you know, you're not getting this super distinct, you know, harsh shape or whatever. Again, you like, if this is just directly on, you know, your paper like that, and then you go back in and start blending that in. See that that's not, that line of brown isn't blending at all, right? But if you add this down first, like this, and then you go into it like that, right? You can manipulate it so much easier. So get those base layered coats down. You know, just what whatever media you happen to be using, and it just makes the blending portion of it, you know, so much easier. A lot of times when people are doing um, coloring, they're looking for one color in certain types of um, color schemes that they're working in. So they might be thinking of, you know, okay, I want like a, a grass green or something like that. You know, so they're looking through their um, pads or they're looking for, okay, that one pad looks like grass green. And then they're coloring, you know, they're dabbing in or whatever with their applicators, that one tone of green, but it's not going to be as rich is if you use kind of multiple whatever values of it you know it, can, it could just be all just greens but use different values of it um, but then especially if you start to bring in and introduce other you know kind of similar related colors into the mix it, it just will look so much richer as a result and again it's just so much easier to do because if you add those base layer colors down you can really blend things out if you get a kind of an undesirable application of something, you know, it's too harsh or something like that. 
All right, so here's a little bit of blue tone in here just to change, uh, just to add a little twist. I mentioned I use use a little bit of this blue tone, you know, periodically through my pieces. It just in kind of open areas too. There's a little blue up here in the sky like that. See that little bluish tinge up here like that. And there and there it is right there there right here a little bit and it's barely visible but i think it kind of adds to the overall appearance um, no matter almost no matter what color scheme you're using or whatever thing is i don't think i used all these pens but uh that's the most amount of pens i've ever pulled out of my uh sets here. Let me get some of those put away here. Okay, so Linda D has been working on a mountain, lake, and distant tree scene while watching and listening. Don't let me distract you, Linda. <laughs> and I am one of those people, Kevin, I can see that tree through that. Oh, okay. I would mask, although clearly I don't need to. If you're going to be distracted by it as the artist of your piece, then by all means mask off, you know. Um, there's various levels of it, okay? Um, degrees of uh, kind of um, detailing and distraction. I'm not saying that that's a bad thing. I mean, it's, you know, masking off. I mean, that's a, that's a good um, exercise and process. Um, but I've had, I've had people, you know, in a workshop before, not too many. I mean, this is like an extreme because it, I remember it and it stood out to me, but, um, someone would be doing, we weren't doing like full size scenes. We'd be doing quarter page pieces, but you know, I, I've had, I've, I've been called over before, um, to, to help people out. And, you know, I don't think this, I don't, I'm not saying I'm not putting them down or anything like that, but, um, you know, they're literally like saying, okay, like, like there's like a, like a dot, like a lint dot right there. And someone said, Hey, you know, I, this is bothering me <laughs> on their piece. I mean, not too many, but the, yeah, there's been a couple people like that, you know, they're, you know, they're meticulous. Okay. So it, it might work for them in their favor too sometimes because they're super detail oriented, but you know, uh, for me, something like that degree of sensitivity towards certain things might, for me, that would just, it would, it would slow me down a little bit, but you know, like I said, uh, for them, um, maybe that's, uh, that work, it really works for them. You know, that degree of, uh, detail and you know exact whatever exactness is that a word okay so going on with the colored pencils um, these are getting into areas that are much more detail oriented i can't really color over the um the alcohol inks very well because the alcohol inks kind of create a little bit of a sealant in some ways but again so like this right here, you can see the difference between this and this. I put a little alcohol ink right there. So, eh, okay, this is going over it. But so one area looks really shiny and this one looks kind of flat. And like I said, that spray sealant will eradicate that part of it. So see like right here, um, if this uh, part, this part right here, Linda, you were saying that you would be able to see that and you mask that off. But for me, um, seeing through this tree right here a little bit and having that, you know, that maple treetop texturing showing through that thematically for me is um, saying that, uh, you know, like these trees in here were clear cut. So this is like a ghost version of what once was in, uh, the better times. <laughs> that was a joke, folks. All 
I always say that, you know, you can make up the reasons for why something is after the fact. It doesn't have to be kind of like a proactive reason why you did it. That's what we all did in the, I don't know, certain classes in college. In the drawing and painting stuff, you, I don't know, it's like a drawing and painting classes. Those, the people that majored in drawing and painting, I mean, everyone had to take the same base co courses, so I took all the drawing and painting classes and things like that. But when you start getting into, like, illustration or, like, graphic design or something like that, they don't want to hear, you know, people making up reasons why, you know, that thing over there is, like, lighter and, you know what I mean, from a, I don't know, whatever, deeper meaning standpoint. You know, it's a lot more practical. But in, I don't know, drawing and painting, it's like, um, I don't know, just things happen kind of by chance and you're kind of come up with a reason why you did that afterwards during the, uh, the critique. <laughs> and they weren't looking for, yeah, uh, I did that because it looks better. You know what I mean? They're not looking for that as a, you know, the, the critique dialogue. All right, this is brown here. So just try, you know, creating a little bit more um, variation within um, these areas in here where, you know, like a big wadded up paper towel is not going to be really uh, conducive for that you know, for that activity. So you can get in, just color in wherever you want within this space, like big open spaces here too, you know, going in and adding a little bit more shading around here with a pencil is often good. Um, you can do that with, the, you know, the alcohol markers too, if you want to. Karen, you like horses, huh? Have you mentioned that before? That sounds familiar. I think someone else mentioned that they uh, they like horses too. All right, this is yellow, so kind of brightening up some areas. It doesn't really show in kind of darker areas, but it kind of warms it up a little bit. Okay, my trees up here are not going to take any of this, uh, this at all because they are completely coated with alcohol. All right. Let's try a little bit more down here. It's really warm as is. That can increase it a little bit. And again, I, I'm just trying to, you know, I'm doing stuff um, as a, a little bit of a, a counter to my first couple scenes too. So I might be jacking this up a little bit in terms of the vibrancy than what I would normally do if I was just doing this one off. But I want this one to really look, you know, a decent amount different from those first two scenes, you know, to just, you know, to create some contrast between them. If, if, if anyone doesn't know what I'm talking about, I did the same composition, you know, the past two days, but I finished it off in um, a different color scheme to represent maybe a different time of day or something like that, or a different season. Okay, here's that same kind of aqua blue um, color that I really like adding into um, different types of uh, color scenarios, okay? So let's put a little bit right down here. It just makes it makes it a little bit more jewel-like, I, I think, in some ways. Or iridescent, you know, having that little bit of cool kind of amongst um, warmth. Um, yeah. Okay, so that is that. 
Here's another little bit of a darker blue. I won't be covering up everything that I just applied with a lighter blue. I just want to accent it a little bit more like that in that water area. Um, here's a little bit of darker green. With so much alcohol ink, I always mention that as I'm putting my hand down here, it's all sticky in here because it has that alcohol ink kind of finish to it. It's not coming off on my hand or anything like that, but it just gets really tacky. All right. You can go a little bit overboard with this. Don't go like, you know, a huge amount overboard but you know you can go a pretty decent amount because I'm you know I'm going to be adding in um, paint pens into this too so it's going to help redefine a lot of areas that maybe get a little bit too muddled um, with tone although I, I have to say I haven't this one I'm getting less muddled <laughs> in terms of my color layering in these areas like especially like right in here than I have in the past for some reason. Maybe I'm maybe I'm spending more time time with the uh, the base layers or something like that. So I'm able to spread it around a lot faster or easier. You know, if it gets a little bit too kind of um, I don't know, like muddy. All right. Go see the bridges in Madison. I need to go see those. I was watching a little documentary on the filming of, of the movie that came out. And they said they, I think the movie production asked, hey, you know, we want to do some filming and stuff like that. Uh, what do you think? And um, one of the deals was that, um, yeah, they said, yeah. And then, but the filming production, you know, they added in some things, you know, to help preserve the bridges too. So, um, you know, they freshened them up or whatever, or, you know, contracted, uh, you know, to get them a little bit, um, you know, uh, whatever, clean, you know what I mean? Uh, not, not necessarily cleaned up, but, you know, whatever, reinforced, so that was one of the uh, the benefits of uh, you know the movie uh, Bridges of Madison County. Okay, let's see. I'm what the thing that I'm looking for is kind of overall um, intensity, I guess, of the scene. I think that bridge is fine now in terms of the intensity. It's not like this dull kind of version of something right back in here. I'm looking for shadow opportunities. And here's a black pencil. So this right here, I need to kind of tone that out a little bit more. Like this. Uh, right there, I need to, you know what I mean? I blackened that out because, um, because Linda is able to see that. <laughs> All right. That alcohol ink sure is sticky. All right. A little bit more separation. Again, this is how this is looking right here. Here, let me let me tune down my exposure here a little bit. All right, there we go. Things aren't looking so washed out. But that's about how, you know, this card is looking now. Hey, is this a card? I don't know. Whatever, scene. 
Use this brown in here. I mean, I, I think I could have been done here with this, uh, you know, the, uh, the colored pencils. I'm going a little bit more than probably what, you know, needs to be done or whatever. It's the final piece of uh, the trio, so I don't know. I'm probably spending a little bit more time on it than I normally would. Okay, let me render this um, bridge slightly more. I'm just going to vary the value from front to back slightly. And I'll do it on the rooftop as well. Just to make it turn in space a little bit more, it seems like it goes back in the distance a little bit more if you just shade it on some area. And you can shade like this side of it too a little bit more. You can go from kind of dark light, dark like that if you want to. And if you shade this side, then this side, the front of it, stands out a little bit different. So you have three sides of a three-dimensional structure. And if you shade them or color them a little bit differently, um, it looks more three-dimensional that way. So three different values, okay. It do, they don't have to be extreme, but if you just change it a little bit, um, it's usually a little better from a three-dimensional standpoint. All right, so. Actually, I think I do need to... That looks a little bit dark here. Uh, that Okay, that's about... There's a little bit glary in here, but the, the colors right here that are showing on my screen, that's a little bit closer to the original piece right now. Okay, so let's go in with the paint pens. I'm glad you like uh, the layering of Colors Genie because there is a lot of them on this one too. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, now I, I'm doing things a certain way here too. There's other methodology that um, people use when doing their color schemes. My method, I think, is it's not necessarily like the way to do it, but I think it's the easiest way in that there's a lot of colors blending into everything else, okay? But I've seen other people's scenes um, sometimes where it's like, okay, the grass is green, the cabin is brown, and the sky is, let's say, blue or something like that, or just whatever color schemes they're doing, and they don't merge colors like that. Um, into one another. And when I see those ones, I really like those. Um, there's just this, it's like super crisp and clean looking, okay, um, by relation. And I really like that look too. But when I'm doing this and I'm really, you know, those greens are up in here, but there's more greens in the grass, you know. You don't read green in like in the trunks. But then these trunks right here, you know, there's brown in the grass, but you're not necessarily saying, oh, there's brown grass there. Although, I don't know, maybe a little bit. <laughs> and then there's reds up here but and oranges, but then I brought some of it into that grass, but I blended it out. So there's hints of everything in every other area, you know, the blue up in here and in the road like that. It creates a little bit of kind of continuity between everything. Um, and for me too, I mean, I'm not consciously thinking about, oh, I got to make things as easy as possible for me, but I know it does. Um, but, uh, you know, again, I, I, I do like other looks as well. So that's where, yeah, that's where you bring it in certain colors into certain areas. Okay, this is the three millimeter uh, paint pen. And I'm adding that down. Yeah, this one's really standing out against the background, so I'm not going to use too much of it, but I want this kind of real sparkly, kind of shimmery, kind of end result look in this scene, especially because these trees are really going to be treated with a lot of, um, you know, sparkle and 
uh, uh, what a texture up there being fall colored. So, okay, so I need to break out some other colors like this, you know, up there in those trees. We'll bring a little bit of green up there as well. Oh, they're restored and most aren't over water. Oh, got it. All right, uh, Merry Christmas, Linda D. All right, let's go up here in these trees. And one of the things that, you know, I always mentioned is that, okay, let me start off with the darker tones. This is really going to stand out kind of weird in terms of a texture up there. But, you know, when we bring in that texture over everything, it makes more sense from a kind of a universal, you know, whatever lighting scheme, I guess. All right, so my trees got pretty dark because, you know, they did start off green. So this is a, it's not a, you know, a light color, you know, there it is against white, but it's really standing out because it is quite a bit lighter than what I'm applying it over. So everything's kind of relative, right? It's by relation. So this orange next to something darker, you know, is much lighter. I'm putting it over some of these areas that are yellow and this orange is darker than that. So, um, yeah, I don't know, you know, it is, if you're not sure where to put it, um, add it into areas. I'm adding it into areas that are roughly the same value as that orange. So they're not standing out too much, but then I creep it out into uh, the darker area like that, okay? So these are kind of acting as highlights. Um, it, they're more than highlights though, because these ones are just, you know, they're like shimmery little leaves or something like that too, but for the most part, I added in an area that you can't see it, and then you just kind of move it out in the, you know, the surrounding areas. That's what I do with the white pigment ink. I added in the white because you can't see it, then I creep it out into that surrounding area. So it's the same concept. This one just happens to be doing it with a detail-oriented, you know, whatever marker device. And with um, pigment ink, it's much more of a diffused kind of look. But you can see right here, it's kind of the, these little dots like this. You're kind of bringing these areas to life in terms of lighting like that. And that's just one color. We'll bring in yellows, maybe reds and greens up there too. Okay. And again, um, I always mention that Keep in mind, it looks weird when you're just doing it like initially. It's like, oh my God, that stands out too much. That's not what it's supposed to look like. But um, we bring it together later um, or even more, you know, with uh, additional textures. So again, foreign texture. Anytime you do that with anything, you add in a new color. It's like, oh my God, that's, that's really standing out weird. You know what I mean? But then you kind of make it a little bit more universal, textures, colors, everything like that. I always say these things because, you know, there's a lot of times when um, people get doing um, scenes or something like that, and they might see the end result and know what I used, but, you know, during the process, you know, there's a lot of times when things don't look, you know what I mean? Great, uh, as is, until you get to some sort of unifying type of, you know, whatever uh, process step, okay? So that's why I always tell people, don't throw stuff out. Um, and, uh, you know, um, whatever the, uh, the, um, the processes or kind of solutions. I don't really see them as solutions. I, you know, for me, they're just kind of um, one step in the process and they just didn't get to the end steps yet. So it wasn't like where something kind of went haywire and, uh, oh my God, there's no turning, you know, there's no, there's no 
um, turning back from it or repairing whatever, repairing it. Okay, so I'm right here in these grassy little clusters. I'm doing this with the three millimeter, the, the 0.7 millimeter is going to be better for this, but this, this is just giving me these little things. But when you add these little things like this, now it looks like these little ridges, tufts of grass like that, right? And again, I'm kind of adding it in the lighter area. See, if I added it over here, it'd really stand out um, a lot. Maybe I'll do that with more of the, the smaller version of it, uh, that color. All right, so see, it's kind of, you know, coming to life a little bit. Um, let's add a couple of these. You know, these trees were a little bit green up here too, so I'll add some of this up here. that um, here's yellow I've I've uh, we've ditched the uh, the light beam by the way if anyone was on here in the beginning I was thinking about possibly having some light beams coming into here the the <laughs> the sky is just too dark for that now you wouldn't have this uh these crepuscular rays kind of going through the scene. All right, this yellow is a lot lighter uh, of a hue. So maybe I'll add less of it. And just because it stands out so much more than that, uh, the orange. This is going to look a little, a little bit um, darker too when it dries it becomes a little bit more transparent with the color underneath showing through it so it won't be quite as um stark you know like that all right i'm able to get a pretty small little dot with this i'm finding just by tapping it a little bit you know more delicately Okay, this yellow right here, I think it's this yellow is really waking up this um, grassy area here. Like right through here, like that. Go full screen. Uh, put it on your uh, put it on your widescreen TVs. <laughs> if everyone's going like full screen, I, I need to like zoom out. It looks better like that. <laughs> You'll see all my little you know those little things that uh, that might uh, that might bother you though fingerprints you know all that uh, type of stuff that's going on okay so here's those were my larger um paint pens let's go i'm not going to use all these okay i just grabbed a bunch i was, was kind of surprised at the the range of tones like you know like these three here they look pretty similar to each other i'm kind of surprised that uh, that they're in that uh that artistro set okay so this is the orange that was similar to that first one that I used. Okay, well, I'm not gonna do too much of it. Um, you know, because we already established a lot of it with the, with the larger one. Let's add some of this down here. Just a little smaller kind of touch. All right. 
right. I'm kind of clustering it here and there throughout the uh, the meadow, again for um, a little bit of color continuity. Oh, let's see. I don't know if this one's going. Let me see here. This one's even lighter right here. Let me try this one. This one almost looks like fluorescent, you know, yellow or something like that. I don't, I don't know if I've even used this one before. Okay, there it goes. It's kind of that little mixing ball is like lodged, like fixed in there. Okay, now I have used it before. It's, it's right in the tip there. Yeah, it's like a fluorescent, uh, fluorescent color. This one right here, man, this one's really, really flowing and kind of almost watery. It's like a different chemistry from the uh, some of the other colors. All right, boy, that really stands out. Okay, I'm gonna be a little bit more selective with my use of this one. This one really stands out. I almost feel like like it's standing out more than um, white would because it's got that fluorescent type of um, tone to it. Okay, let's see. A little bit more sparkly and alive with uh, dots, huh? Dots really make the, uh, can really uh, bring things out so much more in uh, pieces. I'm thinking, okay, so I'm looking at um, this area up in here. Did I use, I'm looking for, oh, okay, here we go. I was going to say, I don't think I've used this one yet. I, we need to go a little bit more yellow up into those trees, I think. Just something different, huh? <laughs> Kay and Linda are, uh, Linda B are our masters. I think I was thinking about using some liquid frisk on something. Um, I think it was the um, the birch trees, but I never got around to doing that um, because, oops, I really wanted that um, those trees, you know, the the bark to be nice and white. Now I would never, I would never do like birch trees or something like that and just stamp right over the top of them and have, you know, stuff like that showing through. But when the trees are kind of like solids like this, um, I just, I just put the trees right over the top. So I made my trees, I drew them <clears throat> with a certain density of, uh, you know, tone for stamping ease. In other words, you know, when you have stuff in the background, you can just stamp right over the top of it and not have to worry about it. Um, but then you do have, I wanted them to have some detail in them so they are a little bit open with texture. So um, if you want a mask, uh, by all means mask. Um, if you don't want a mask, um, you don't need to, but then just fill it in with some more tone. Just in general, you know, masking's, masking's a pretty good idea. Um, that I never do. <laughs> 
Unless I have to. Now, on, on something like this, if I'm, you know, if I'm coming over with something like this and I have a, a cabin or something like this, I don't want, I mean, uh, this bridge, I don't want this bridge in there. You know what I mean? So I would mask it off like a structure or something like that. But if it's just like texturing from a, another tree, you know, a little bit of foliage or something like that. Yeah, that's when I don't do it. Sedge filler, stuff like that. Grasses. I think the one stamp that I do mask off probably more than anything else, um, even though it is fairly solid, it's the lighthouse, um, you know, because I don't have any trees uh, around it or something like that, you know, so it's just like, you know, it's a solid form and I don't want, uh, like if I have clouds or something like that in the back of it, um, I, I'll mask that one off, but it's just putting a piece of, you know, paper towel next to it or something like that. Nothing too extensive. All right. So this is the yellow. I wanted to really kind of brighten things up a little bit and make it a little bit more sparkly. I think in the last couple of scenes I did, I, I kind of, well, I don't know. I was getting kind of crazy with all the dots, you know, I don't know, whatever, 6,000 of them. So I stopped, but I did add a little bit more after the, uh, after the video the next day. Only because these scenes, you know, these scenes are fairly large. So it's like, eh. And I added a little bit more of a, a warmth into the road on the uh, yesterday's blue tone scene. Okay, so that is the colored pen dots. Because we are going to use white pigment ink and we're going it's going to represent white kind of mist and lighting in here. We're going to use a little bit of this white paint pen. I'm not gonna go as crazy as I did with the other colors. This one's going to be this one's going to stand out so much more, probably by contrast. So it's kind of more of just the, the brightest of, or the lightest of highlights in here. Um, if you don't have any kind of white remaining anywhere, I wouldn't use white really, you know, use a beige or something like that. Um, because the white might stand out a little bit too stark where, you know, there isn't any kind of white lighting coming into the scene anymore. Okay. So go with something a little bit um, duller in terms of your uh, reflected light, right? Because what these, you know, these things are kind of representing are reflected lights. So they would be the color of your lighting in a scene. You know, not necessarily every time, but it, sometimes when I, I've done it, um, when the scene isn't, you know, I don't know, the lightest area is like a light blue or something like that. And if I put like a sparkly white little kind of reflected area, it's kind of stand, stood out a little bit to me. Um, from a visual sense. So, but you know, the good thing is if you have these sets of pens these days like that, you have like every color to choose from now. Before I, you know, I was using, I don't know, like whatever, a pack of those Sharpie um, paint pens. And, you know, there was, a, I don't know, like four, four or five colors at most. And then I started going into the, uh, the gel pen sets too, but um, the gel pen sets just didn't work as good as the, uh, these, uh, these paint pens here. Great for gel pens, though. They make excellent quality gel pens these days that that are less uh, prone to clogging because the uh, the density of the ink is thinner. So not quite as opaque, but you don't have to worry about them kind of clogging and not working on you know for you you know after you know a very short amount of time if not brand new. <laughs> All right, let's 
fence right here. If you're going full screen, maybe you can see this. I know a lot of people watch these videos on their, uh, like, you know, on your phones too. So, um, I don't know, maybe the scenes look even better like that. <laughs> kind of smaller and condensed and kind of, you know, more, uh, uh, whatever, general, you know. Okay, so I'm adding a little bit of highlight. I added a little bit too much <clears throat> on yesterday's scene, I thought. Okay, I've clogged right here. Okay, it's flowing again. Sometimes, if you've just logged on and haven't seen me use these pens before, if you're going over, like, um, colored pencil and, I don't know, other other dots that you've already laid down, you know, the pen might get um, a little bit of a pigment or something like that up into the uh, the feeder nib, and you just got to get that flowing again. So just kind of scribble it around a little bit or give it a good whack, you know, with the cap on, tip down, and it'll get flowing again pretty good. Okay, let me see if I can get in and add some trunks under these trees. I think this is flowing enough. Yeah, okay. All right, there's a lot of texture in here and there's a lot of waxy buildup from my uh, colored pencils in here. So I'll see what I can do here. Okay, it's flowing pretty good. So a little bit of these tree trunks and branches. Okay. I think I'm clogged again almost. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, there we go. So you, you bring in, you know, some of those branches in there like that. It looks a little bit more, I don't know. It gives it a little bit more structure, I think, within those trees like that, to have some of those, you know, those white branches and whatnot throughout there, as opposed to just being kind of like a big mass of like a hedge row or something like that. All right, so that is that. We are coming down in the home stretch here. Uh, Jeannie, can't wait to see you do that. Uh, Jeannie, you're gonna do, do it all in your, uh, with that cool kind of, uh, you know, uh, like German expressionism, you know, uh, movement to your uh, scenes and all that uh, paint work. I was gonna say like uh, Jeannie, and, uh, Jeannie and Linda B are in here. I was gonna, Linda B's uh, one of her latest uh, pieces um, was almost more um, well not more but uh, it's like halfway it's like half it's like turning into um, like half painting and half uh, half painting and half uh, I don't know traditional stamp uh, media which is really cool so you can get a lot of personal expression kind of with you know, the application of kind of free-formed hand-added um, media into your scene. So paint pens are a really good way to do that. Um, certainly um, brushwork types of things. I'm going to add in something I saw in a, in a photograph. 
and that is these little pink little um, flowers uh, in a given meadow. I looked up, um, I think I looked up Sunset Meadow or something like that um, before I jumped on to, uh, to do this scene. And one of them was this meadow and uh, the sunset was, you know, there was reddish tones in the sunset and um, it was in a field of poppies, but the poppies were, weren't orange. They were more of like a red poppy somewhere. I don't know what country it was. And that looked really cool. So I'm not going with red here. I'm going just with pink, but um, I don't know. Yeah, you can see this a little bit throughout here. That one really stands out a little bit too much, but anyway, so just a little bit of different color down here. It just kind of breaks things up slightly, but it's almost like non-visible, you know? So as I always mention, you know, someone kind of took a look at your scene that you, you know, you gave your scene to someone and, uh, um, you know, they really kind of held it up and looked at it closer. Um, you'd really be rewarding them um, for for doing that, you know, for really, you know, taking the time to, uh, to look into details or something like that. That's what I always do when I always look at, uh, you know, I'm looking at people's pieces that they post, uh, you know, online, uh, whatever, Facebook or something like that. Um, I'm always drawn into those little details, you know, somewhere. Um, you know, you look at the overall too. That's the, that's the thing that, um, that gets your attention first, you know, the overall structure and color schemes and all that type of thing. But then I spend most of my time like looking in little areas like that um, of the pieces and my eyes, you know, typically it just gets affixed to some of those smaller details that um, people add into uh, their scenes. It's like the, the little micro world <laughs> of the uh, things. All right, so, um, okay, so white pigment ink, okay. All right, smashing this down, getting it really compressed back into that so it's nice and flat. Okay. My my pad isn't super juicy, you know, with the ink on here. It's probably like a medium. I think I did re-ink it fairly recently, but um, it almost applies more like a, like a powder, okay? I, I am testing it here, but I'm also kind of smashing this right here. And then you start applying it in those areas that are lighter where it doesn't show up too much. Yeah, and where you want some of it as well. So I want some of it at the base of my little figures here, my horse kind of walking out in the, uh, into the scene. And when you do that, it looks like this low line fog and plus it just, <clears throat> it varies the the values of the impression so it doesn't look so flat. You know, you have areas that are darker and areas that are lighter like that. Now, if you really planned out, I mean, I could have, when I stamped that out, I could have wiped off some of the, those legs a little bit and then stamped it out and it would have looked lighter too. Um, I don't, you know, I, I, I mean, I do that sometime, but I really wasn't thinking about it on this one. Okay, so a little bit of it's coming out this way. <clears throat> this is what I've been doing to this tree on, I think, every scene that I've done. The first two is I've kind of added that little bit of uh, fog down at the base there like that, and then I've crept it back here a little bit. So it's, again, it's not just this application right here. What you do is you add it there, and then you transition it into the darkness like that, okay? If you ever add too much, you know, just, you know, take a clean part of your cotton ball or paper towel and just kind of wipe that off like that. And, you know, it'll come right off. You know, if you don't get it where you want to, or if you've added too much, sometimes I add a little bit too much in certain areas and I just dab it off with my finger like this, you know? 
Okay, so anyways. Uh, know that when you spray seal these things too, um, when it dries it gets lighter, and also when you spray seal it, it becomes a little bit more um, transparent, depending on how much you spray it with. You know, so if you want it to show, then you just do kind of a little quick dusting of it. You know, spray from distance and let it just lay down there like that and let it dry. And then if you want to need to spray seal more, then hit it again. Uh, but do it in very light applications, which sometimes I don't do because I get impatient or something like that. But if it ever eradicates it completely and you can't see it, then just apply it right over the top of the spray seal and then spray seal that in, okay? So it's like the, uh, the white is going to be in between two layers of the acrylic spray. Uh, sealant or fixative. All right. <clears throat> I always like doing this on my uh, bridge. Like there's a little bit of kind of fog right in there. And then I, I usually throw it down at the base down here too. Like it's <clears throat> some of that fog coming off of the uh, the water. Oh, I didn't do some things right down in here. I'll get to that. Um, I didn't highlight some of my rocks down with that white paint pen. Let's add some of this right up here in these trees because there is light up here. So you can really push kind of light and depth in there by making some of those trees in the background. You know, I mean, these trees are the most distant things in the scene, so you can kind of push them back with um, some of this texture and lighting like that. I got one of my big fingerprints right up there in the sky, so I'm going to mute that a little bit with a little bit of a pigment ink. There's my fingerprint right there, so... I'll just put a little bit of a, a dusting of light over the top of that. All right, and how about this right down in here? Over some of this fence, maybe. This is a little bit darker over here, so I won't put too much over there. You can just put a really thin layer of it like that. You know, like, I don't know, maybe that stands out a little bit too much. Go like that. Okay, I have a very busy meadow here, so this is going in and kind of mellowing out some of it. Not putting it over everything, but you just bring some of this into it a little bit. And it adds that kind of that soft lighting going back into the, you know, the distance like that. All right. Um... Let's grab this white pen here. Not a movie star here, that's for sure. It's been a while before I can get my giant trees, but I'm itching. Yeah, Linda. I told, I. they thought, they, they were saying that they don't ship internationally, but I, I asked them why. They said, well, there was just certain things with like ETA, you know, or VAT taxes and um, shipping complicated. I'm thinking. I and I told them. I said, "Hey, you know, what do you, what do you mean that you know VAT doesn't come into play for you know? All you do is just declare the value of the uh, the shipment. And if you're shipping like UPS, you just have to include a uh, you know a copy of the invoice." Um, with the mailing label, or if you're sh shipping U.S. P 
post, all you do is, you know, you just declare the, uh, the value of the, uh, the contents as you're making the label. And that's the only difference between domestic and uh, international. So I don't know that we're going to look into that. Okay, so I'm adding in a little bit of a highlight on some of my rocks down in here. Um, and down in this little meadowy area, you know, all I, my rocks in here got, you know, they're green. <laughs> they're green and brown now, so I'm just kind of um, reestablishing them just by putting a little bit of a white highlight on the top of it. Okay, so it, you know, it looks more varied throughout there. Looks like, I don't know, like an Easter scene or something like that. Okay, let's bring in a little bit more of a twinkly highlight now. I've added some of that white back in here uh, with white pigment ink. So it's muted some areas out a little bit, so you can go in and kind of add a little crisp little tones back into it again if you want to. Look at that. All right, let me see. All right, so this is how this is looking right here. This is a little bit glary like that, but you can see that Brilliance Ink is catching some of that light. Use any kind of light um, pigment ink, though. It doesn't have to be the Brilliance, okay? Um, especially when it's on um, the semi-gloss cardstock. If you're doing it on um, a glossy cardstock, then it's a good idea to probably use Brilliance, but if you don't have that, I, I didn't use Brilliance. I used um, Colorbox. Um, clear snap color box white for years which is the same you know pigment ink as you know basically all the rest of them and when you're doing it in a very thin layer like this pigment inks you know traditionally won't dry on top of a glossy cardstock but if you're just adding this really thin layer of it it's not a problem for it to dry on there okay so you don't need to worry about that it's just a very thin layer okay um, and it's like, you know, like I said, uh, I think it was yesterday, I, I said, think about it, you know, when you're applying these thin layers of a pigment ink, think about it like you're, think about it like a, you're putting a, like a dusting of a, like dry media or powder over it, but that's kind of the, uh, the texturing that you want. You don't want, you know, a big sloppy application of wet, you know, white pigment ink in there. All right, so finishing up here a little bit, a little bit more highlighting. I think things got a little bit too diffused in there. I think I have a little bit too much white pigment ink in there. Let me wipe some of that off right here. There was just too much of a big glob, like a continuous glob in here. So I'm wiping it off in between that and this right down here. So. And it's pretty dark right here, so let me wipe some of that off right here, too. We'll just get a little bit of it right down there, like that. All right, so that is the scene. Like that. Let's comp let's take a look. I haven't looked at, compared it with the other two um, that were done here, so. I haven't compared it in a while. Like, what, how long has this been? Like a couple of hours or something like that. So, yeah, you know, eh, this one's like, this one's the most vibrant. This one looks rather dull now by contrast, doesn't it? <laughs> it's like that one really stands out like with impact. This is the first one though. Now this one in comparison to this one was looking a lot more vibrant and rich now see how dull my trees are though. Those trees are going to get much richer as a result right here. But um, yeah. Okay, this is where I added. I added a little bit more warmth into this one. And then again, these trees are going to get much, much darker, you know, when I spray seal it. So, but still with that degree of warmth up there, a lot more uh, impact. So in doing like visual, seeing these right here, like, on these two right here, maybe I'll kick this one up a little bit more, not in this video right here, live stream, but I'll bring a little bit more yellows, I think, into these trees and make those areas in the grasses a little bit brighter at least. And maybe bring a little bit more green tones into here. And on this one, maybe I'll need to spray seal it before I see what it looks like. But um, 
uh, a little bit more brightness, I think, you know. I could spray seal this too and come into it more with um, some additional pigment, um, alcohol inks too. So, yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll get these matching a little bit more in terms of intensities though. Um, but I don't know, this one right here with the, uh, with all those warm tones on there and autumn colors and ochre. <laughs> that ochre played a big role in terms of the uh, overall intensity of this piece, huh? All right, so that is that. I'm angling this up because it, it's not, it doesn't have some much glare on it um, like that, but um, I don't know. I usually put these right next to it so people can see the general size of it. If you just kind of take a photograph of this, you know, it could be, you know, a quarter page piece, you know, four and a quarter by five and a half for all anyone knows. But anyways, that should do it right there. Hope you enjoyed the, uh, whatever, the, uh, the three panel <laughs> sequence. And I'm going to have to go back in and tweak those other ones, though. Those ones are uh, just a little bit too... Uh, dull on the uh, the intensity uh, scale. Even if it, I don't want those things to be super bright, but I want them to be brighter in certain areas there. So I think that'll be better. Let's see here. Uh, Linda B will be doing it in mini form. Great. I'm going to be doing these in mini form too. I, I want to do um, this same composition, you know, on, you know, the... Uh, the printable vinyl too, I think. Maybe not the, not in full size. I don't know if I'm going to go full size with it, but um, um, yeah, because I, you know the only sky areas is going to be up here, so I'll do it in a different size. Maybe in a slimline card like this right here, but on the printable vinyl. You got hey, I, that even looks pretty good like that, you know. Yeah, I guess that looks pretty good. I was wondering if that looked better in terms of you know a slimline card just with this portion up top. Um, hmm. And I, maybe I'll do it, yeah, like I said, maybe I'll do it in a slimline or something like that. Okay, the paint pen brought this, yeah, yeah. The paint pen really helped out. There was a lot of, um, there was a lot of kind of muddled colors in there. So you kind of, def you kind of muddled everything up a little bit but you get the intensity of the colors, but the forms aren't defined anymore with that degree of um, coloring on there. So you bring back the definition of things with the paint pens in there. So um, things go from crisp when you stamp them out, you know, just crisp black and white impressions, and they get really diffused with all that coloring on there. And then you go back in with certain things like the detailed paint pens, and that brings back the definition back into all that, those richer colors like that. And then you diffuse it again with, you know, like the paint pen. I mean, uh, the, the white pigment ink in certain areas, you know, so things aren't just like vibrating, you know, with little colored dots or something like that. So what is it? Crisp, diffused, crisp, diffused. <laughs> Do I critique your work, Linda? Yeah, I probably do bring out some things to you because you're at that, you've been at that point for a while. But th generally there's not really much to critique on your pieces, you know. They're just, you know, there's, you, you, <laughs> there's not really much to say, you know what I mean? Except admiration, you know, comments of admiration or something like that. But if you do, if you, point out something, you know what I mean? That was like, oh, I ran into this, you know what I mean? Or something like that, you know what I mean? And that's when I generally comment on it. Um, if there's like some kind of like a process that I've, you know, encountered similar to it and, you know, I, I found a solution to it. I don't know, I'll, I'll see about that international shipping on there, you know? Uh, they might have changed their mind. I don't know. I'll have to talk with them about it. Uh, you know, the one thing about international shipments of those um, foamies is that they are large. So you're not making, you're not taking advantage of like an envelope 
um, with something like that, unless they can fit into a, like a flat rate on. But the thing about it, I told them um, the uh, there's this company called PirateShip.com, and that's who I'm shipping out U, U, UPS and US Postal Service stuff with. And for some reason, that company is able to contract much lower rates for things like international UPS shipments. So um, I don't know, it's like 70% off, you know, uh, like a United Parcel, UPS um, expedited. So it's like even faster and might be cheaper than um, uh, US Postal flat rate envelopes, sometimes by a lot too. So yeah. Let's see, maybe they change their mind. Yeah, the box, yeah, shipping all that stuff. It's it's those foamies get pretty pretty big. Um it it can make a big difference, Shelly, after you seal it. Um things look much, much deeper in terms of the saturations. And if I've layer if you've layered down whatever, five layers of a uh, dye based transparent inks in there into certain areas, you get that richness. So it's like, you know, if you were to stain wood or something like that, you know how deep that wood looks? It's a similar effect to when you spray seal certain types of media um, with a spray sealant. So again, if you've created depth with the use of your um, media, then you'll get the depth with a spray sealant. Now, if you've only done like one layer of something, then the sealant would only act to preserve it and protect it. It's not going to make things look like super deep if there's only like one layer of media on there or like chalks or something like that. It's not going to, it's not meant to, you know, make it look super deep, but transparent media, especially. Um, so your alcohol inks and your um, dye-based inks in this situation will make it look much more vibrant and rich, especially in areas if they've dried dull, like you know, memento and ranger inks tend to look when they dry, especially when used in multiple layers. Um, it's a, it's a big, big difference. It, just check out my spray sealing videos and you'll be able to see. I, you know, I'll typically spray like one half of it so you can, you know, look and see what, you know, it, one part looks like with and one part looks without. So I have a whole playlist of uh, spray sealing videos, you know. Um, and I, I'm going to spray seal these three all together too in another video coming up here because I really want to see these things, uh, um, how they look after the spray sealing because they've really dried dull. So when I use a ton of ink on something, they typically dry dull unless all the inks are uh, Marvies. Anytime I add in one of the other brands of inks, it dries really dull, which isn't to say that if you're doing, if I do one layer of ink, it doesn't look dull. Okay, it's, it's when you pile them on and there's so much of that um, ink binder, whatever ink companies are using, um, it tends to dry in a dull sheen on the top for some reason. I don't know what it is. Um, it's the thing that's making the inks kind of thick so that they don't run out of the uh, the pads. I'm That's what I'm guessing because Marvy inks are really thin and they don't dry dull. They, they look pretty, they're, they're a lot closer to how they look when they've been freshly applied, when used um, just by themselves. So, yeah. Yeah, Merry Christmas, uh, Linda. Uh, glad you like it, Kay. Annie, glad you like it. Merry Christmas. Bridging the Woods 3. You wonder why and how. Uh, oh, referring to the postage. Um, I don't know. I, in terms of that discount, I don't know. A pirate ship is, um, they've, it's like some, you know, with everything that everyone's using through that's like they've contracted like extremely cheap rates, unless you're saying why, they, why they're not shipping it out um, overseas or internationally. But yeah, I don't know. I need to talk them into it because I, I haven't had any kind of problems in years and years as far as international shipments went. You know, sometimes these days I'm forgetting to include the invoice with the UPS international shipments, which they need. But they just they just get in touch with you. They just, you know, they email you and just say, hey, you know, uh, you know, email me the uh, the invoice and, you know, we'll attach that to the shipment. It's no problem. So, 
Yeah. Do, the, do, we'll do, oh, explanation. Oh, got it. All right. Merry Christmas, everyone. Oh, I hear the uh, the pack of coyotes outside my uh, room right now. They're howling out there every night. There's some big ones out there, too. Thanks, everyone. Have a great, uh, have a great uh, Christmas Eve, Christmas, etc. Whatever you end up doing, stamping stampscapes, of course, on a you know Christmas Eve, right? You're going to be doing like a like snowy types of scenes and whatnot. <laughs> but whatever you do, hope you have a great one. Oh, the uh, the coyotes, Shelley? Yeah, they're across the street. They don't harm anyone. Although I did see a coyote attacking a, like a little infant on YouTube the other day. So not good if people have like cats roaming about and whatnot. But uh, I don't know. We live in this area that's directly across the street from Chaparral. So it's really there, those coyotes uh, territory that we're in here. <laughs> but yeah, big open area. All right. Could you hear, did you hear that? Uh, could you guys hear that? I didn't know if you can hear that or not. All right. Thanks everyone. I really enjoyed this, uh, this uh, series of pieces. I, I hope to do more of these in the future. Um, uh, I don't know if I'll do be like doing full size ones, but I, I should be doing kind of more se you know, sequential types of, uh, pieces with uh, kind of different finishes on them just so we can see what they look like. But I really did enjoy going large on these pieces. I, not something that I do a ton of, but seeing these uh, pieces in a combination like that or sequencing uh, was a little bit different. And I didn't, on this one right here, like I said, it, if we added some, you know, some light beams in there, it really would have been different. But um, I don't know, my darker sky kind of took care of that in terms of uh, eliminating that from uh, one of the possibilities here. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, they are loud. When I hear them howling and stuff, I, I go outside to see if I can see them. I need a big, huge floodlight or something like that so I can, uh, you know, take a look. But sometimes they're like howling, like right around twilight too, where they're, you know, they're out there. Or sometimes even like sunset. I don't know. Yeah. But it's almost like every night now. So, yeah. Yeah. Moose, deer, and foxes. Wow. That's cool, Linda. All right, everyone. Thanks again. Have a great rest of evening, daytime, afternoon, whatever time it is for you. And thanks so much for joining in.